Very good afternoon, everyone. I'm Elliot Howard, Director of Leadership and Volunteer Services for the University of Texas at San Antonio. I'm also a member of the UTSA Marches Planning Committee. For the last several years, we've facilitated UTSA's participation in the San Antonio's MLK Parade, as well as the Cesar Chavez March, and most recently, the Pride Festival. Ensuring a visible and energetic UTSA presence at these events is important in many respects, not least because of the impact it has on those students who participate. Walking those two and a half miles together with the rest of San Antonio gives a glimpse of the beloved community of which Dr. King dreamed. Our planning group has been supported from the outset by the Office of the President and includes members from all across campus, including academic affairs, inclusive excellence, university relations, uh, university technology solutions, academic innovation, the Multicultural Student Center for Equity and Justice, and staff council. Our group also convenes to organize this annual MLK lecture series, which celebrates the spirit and the reverberating energy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And so it's my great pleasure to be the first to welcome you all to this year's program. 
and to give a special welcome to our featured speaker, Professor Fred Bonner. So the pandemic necessitated that we participate virtually in the March this year. And today we're likewise coming together on screen rather than in person. But we are indeed coming together nonetheless. And to celebrate our coming together, we'll hear a performance from the UTSA Women's Choir recorded in the 2019 MLK lecture. Uh, they were so good that day, we've got to play it again. Uh, but before that, it's first my pleasure to introduce the Reverend and Poet Lo Alamon for an invocation. Thank you very much for joining us, Reverend Alamon. We are one in spirit. There are no colors in our souls, no pigments that have seeped deep enough to breach the depths of our hearts, but we were all born from the same shade of love, so may you make us after your own image. May you, God, orchestrate this symphony of melanin to sing the beauty of your face. May our faces be like music. May our colors compose a song that reflects every genre of your love blending. Each of these skin tones into a melody too beautiful for one heart to sing from a choir, from the souls you've acquired from the grave. Though you might sing your name and spring forth back into life as bright as the promise of your rainbow, for you have paid the price for every nation and tongue. Who am I to segregate your treasure? Don't let it be so that when the rooster Jim Crow was denied the Christ was called, all she back into this hole, but instead give sight to these colorblind eyes and make a home out of my lives. I pray that the rhythm of your heart be quick to the very landscape of my world, be to loving those around me. Permit us to see just as you see. That you are always one and at the same time always three, so we were always made in the very image of community and called to worship. As such, just as the morning sun peeled back the night sky, you undressed the flesh off of your soul to present your spirit holy to us, that we might find rest in these blankets of skin you have chosen to wrap us in. And maybe worship like the breaking of a new day. Pulling back these sheets and unwrapping our hearts and the presence and present them in the presence of our King. And be not be foolish enough to think that we can confine your light to one church or contain your glory in just one building or limit your grace to one race or denomination. But may our praises be in both spirit and in truth. For our hearts can only beat so fast. These words can only say so much. And the riches of my gaze often falls cheap on your glory. These hands, these hands can only reach so far. Flesh alone can never give you what you fully deserve, so the skin alone will always limit your worth. So may we not let skin hinder our worship, but paint your name on the altar of our lips, stain our words with the color of your glory, so that whenever we speak about our races, we acknowledge that you are the one that won them, but there are no colors in our souls. Nothing here but your fingerprints that you hold our lives, and the very hand that shaped the world to make everything that has breath praise your grip. For you have multiplied your descendants as numerous as the stars, and our song crescendo with all of creation as we sing praises to you, our Father, the God of all the universe, and every color it has to offer since the beginning. You have carved a new song to the heart of every bird, and they're all different. It's as if you frown on division, but give flight to diversity, I pray. But our love grows wings, takes flight in our communities, and soars straight towards you, that you might take joy in our worship. But our song will be the soundtrack to you moving here among us, but we are yours, God. Living by your image, living out our differences and worshiping together until we are all together as one. In the spirit of unity, in the spirit of you. Amen. Let's come and play. 
Kimberly Andrews Espy, Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs, and it is my honor to welcome you to the Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Annual Lecture. In particular, I'm delighted to welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Fred Bonner, albeit virtually to UTSA. You honor us with your presence, Dr. Bonner. Thank you for being here, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. This event is so near and dear to our hearts as a part of our annual commemoration of the life and legacy of Dr. King. The lecture series gives us an opportunity to recognize and learn from scholars such as Dr. Bonner, who are doing such important work in racial justice and equity. It's also a chance to come together as roadrunners to lift up our black students and other students of color and to affirm our commitment to their success, both here at UTSA and beyond. 
Finally, and critically, through events such as this one, we can engage in continuing the dialogue on the important role of higher education in carrying Dr. King's work forward and in building a more just society. Over the past year, our nation has faced challenges that remind us there is still much hard work to be done and a long journey ahead. And yet we are also heartened by the signs of progress, not the least of which is that one week ago today, our country's first female black South Asian vice president was sworn in. We at UTSA firmly believe the meaningful action to create the change Dr. King and others worked for will be rooted in our fundamental academic principles of dialogue, discovery, and engagement. And as a community of learners and scholars, we embrace this challenge. Again, I thank you all for being here to take part in this important dialogue. It is now my pleasure to introduce Professor and Chair of our new Department of Race, Ethnicity, Gender, and Sexuality Studies, Dr. Aleandra Elenis. Thank you, Dr. Espy. It is an honor to introduce Tiana Gomes, UTSA's 2020 MLK Scholarship recipient. Ms. Gomes graduated from James Madison High School in San Antonio and at UTSA, she's a pre-med kinesiology major. Her father is from Senegal and her mom from the Philippines. In her essay, she wrote about the need to honor both of her parents. In high school, she was senior class vice president, treasurer of Girl Up Student Organization, which empowers femininity and promotes positivity. Girl Up envisions a world where every girl can reach her full potential, a world where girls can lead the way to bigger dreams and happier days, healthier communities and stronger nations, a world where girls are empowered and our future is brighter because of it. And she was also a cheerleader. The UTSA MLK scholarship will assist her to pay for her education as a stepping stone for medical school to become a pediatrician. Tiana wishes to spread positivity wherever she is and empower women's equality. And this is part of how she applies Dr. Martin Luther King's legacy. Please give a warm welcome to Ms. Tiana Gomes. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Professor Linus. I'm honored to speak here at UTSA's MLK Day event. I'm currently in my second semester here at UTSA on the cheer team and studying medical humanities with the goal to attend medical school and become a pediatrician. While the society we live in is much different today, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s message not only still influences me to be better, but also millions of people from all around. Without him and his work, education and civil rights wouldn't have been possible for people like me. And with that, I will never take my education for granted. Another big impact Martin Luther King had on me was the encouragement to vote for change. While it was only my first time voting this past year, I've cherished the opportunity I've been given to use my voice, and I will continue to do so for the time to come. To help and move his dream forward, I strive to advocate for racial and gender equality, and during these uncertain times, I continue to advocate by educating myself and others on racial and gender equality. With my support, I hope we could all move MLK's dream forward and inspire others to gravitate toward his dream of a better America with freedom, equality, and justice for all. It is truly an honor to be speaking here today and to be an MLK scholar. At this time, I'd like to introduce Professor Bonner. Dr. Fred A. Bonner is a professor and endowed chair in educational leadership and counseling and founding executive director of the Minority Achievement Creativity and High Ability Center at Prairie View A&M University. Throughout his career, his work has consistently been centered on microcultural populations, developing attitudes, motivations, and strategies to survive in macrocultural settings. This social justice philosophy has led him to publish numerous articles, books, and book chapters related to academically gifted African-American male college students in varying post-secondary contexts. And now I turn it over to you, Dr. Bonner. Thank you, Tiana, for that wonderful introduction. Greetings. I want to thank the uh, UT San Antonio Martin Luther King Planning Committee. And I also want to send a special thank you to my dear friend and mentor, Ms. Carla Broadus. An additional thank you goes to the Department of REGSS, to REGS. Thank you all, and I look forward to engaging with you. Let's move to the presentation. And today, we are here, we're assembled virtually to honor the life 
Legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And today I'm going to share with you my take on how I honor Dr. King's legacy through a discussion about how Dr. King's dream has impacted and has influenced my research, scholarship, and the work that I do by way of equity, diversity, and inclusion for Black male populations, particularly those who are academically gifted and talented. So I look forward to engaging with you today on my little take on Martin Luther King's dream. Today's presentation, Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream, building on resilience across our communities. I'd like to start off today's presentation by quoting some of Dr. Martin Luther King's most important, most impactful quotes. The time is always right to do what is right. We must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Everybody can be great because anyone, anybody can serve. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. We must build dikes of courage to hold back the flood of fear. Intelligence plus character, that is the goal of true education. With those quotes, I would like to share with you a soundbite, a sermonette, from one of Dr. Martin Luther King's mentors, the Reverend Dr. Samuel DeWitt Proctor. And I would encourage all of you, if you don't know anything about Dr. Proctor, spend a little time and Google him. Dr. Proctor is a towering figure and a very, very important figure from our history. He was president of two historically black colleges and universities, Virginia Union University, and North Carolina A&T University. He worked in the Kennedy administration. He worked for the Peace Corps. He was a tenured professor, one of the first tenured African-American professors at Rutgers University. So just a towering figure. And again, the mentor to Dr. Martin Luther King. And the reason I shared Dr. Proctor's um, short sermonette titled The Scratch Line is that I served as the Samuel D. Witt Proctor Endowed Chair at Rutgers University. And when I accepted this position, I wanted to find something that provided me a conceptual and theoretical framework for who this man was and what his words actually conveyed. So I chose this particular sermonette titled The Scratch Line, and I infused it across all of my activities. I had an historically black college and university dean's think tank and I titled it Moving HBCU Deans Beyond the Scratch Line, a focus on Black education. I actually also hosted a, a STEM think tank for Black males. Black males, Black males in STEM, a focus on achievement moving beyond the scratch line. So everything that I did had this hook of Dr. Proctor's sermon at moving beyond the scratch line. But what I would like to do today is to introduce you to Dr. Proctor and to the scratch line in this very, very short clip. And at the conclusion of this clip, I would like to, for you to consider two questions. The first question is, what are you doing to assist diverse populations to move beyond the scratch line? The second question is, what are you doing to move yourself beyond the scratch line. With that said, let's take a little pause and take a peek at Reverend Samuel DeWitt Proctor, the scratch line. We do not all start at the same scratch line, although there's one original position hypothetically for everybody. You were born here owning nothing, having earned nothing, just born. There you are helpless and you are debtor to everybody. But some of us opened our eyes and saw nothing but blessings just dumping on us. I opened my eyes and there was Herbert and Velma and my grandma Hattie 
a slave in Chesterfield County who finished Hampton in 1882, smiling on me. How in the world could I lose? Taught me how to read and sing four-part harmony before I ever got to school. Taught me how to play the clarinet and the piano. Made me go to Sunday school. Daddy didn't send us. Daddy took us to Sunday school. If there was nobody in the Sunday school but one person, that would have been my daddy with his little six children there in the Sunday school at the Bank Street Bank. That's what I inherited. I didn't earn it. You can't get that with a Visa card. It was given to me. Now all through my neighborhood there were other young fellas. I can remember all of them. Daddies were drunk half the time. They didn't read in their homes. Nobody went to Sunday school. None of that. They started life beneath the scratch line. I started life way above the scratch line. Everywhere I went, somebody said, aren't you Miss Hattie's grandson? Are you Herbert's boy? Skip three grades. I never was in the third grade, the fifth grade, or the seventh grade. Everything smiling on me. Finished high school at 15, went on to college on a scholarship. None of that did I deserve. I hadn't earned any of it. I started out with a head of steam. Yeah. Old North Mission College there had trained my mother and father. They had learned poetry, Paul Lawrence done by Alfred Lord Tennyson. And they gave all of that to us in great abundance. And my buddies up the street had none of that. Now, if we want these bones to live again, those of us who have inherited benefits that we did not earn or deserve, need to turn around and help those who inherited deficits that they did not earn or deserve and help them to rise up to the scratch line where we are, where we are, so that they may earn and enjoy all of the benefits that we so take for granted. Can these bones live again, O oh Lord? Thou knowest these bones can live. And there you have it. Dr. Samuel DeWitt Proctor. And I go back to those um, two questions that I posed to you before the clip. What are you doing to move diverse populations beyond the scratch line? What are you doing to move yourself beyond the scratch line? And I look forward to engaging with you to unpack those questions to see what your responses are. So as I move us forward, another question that I have for you, how am I contributing to MLK's dream? We first heard the scratch line. Now we're talking about MLK and his dream. How are you contributing? How am I contributing to MLK's dream? One of the ways that I share with you, my little foray into contributing to Dr. Martin Luther King's dream is through the work that I do by way of diversity equity, and inclusion. And my focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion is through the lens of the experiences of academically gifted African-American males prime, across the P20 pipeline from pre-kindergarten all the way through graduate school. And as you can see here, I would encourage you to dig down deep and look at how diversity, equity, and inclusion influences your work. And we see here, we know that diversity is multiple identities, in the same context, we know that equity is actually a focus on the renegotiation, the re redistribution of power. Inclusion is uh, thought and perspectives of multiple people in ensuring that all of those perspectives matter. And finally, we talk a lot about diversity, equity, and inclusion, but there's a fourth base that sometimes we leave out. Is diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And belonging is the intersection of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And for belonging, we want to ensure that we have the engagement of each one of these constructs to ensure that everyone not only feels like they're a part, not only feels like they're listened to, but feels like they actually belong in these various contexts. So how do I engage diversity, equity, and inclusion in my work? And how do I try to fulfill and try to meet the charge that Dr. King gave us with his dream? Let's take a look. A very, very short video clip, and I think this sets the stage for the work that I do by way of black males. Hey there, you might have noticed America has a crisis. 
A broken economy for too many, an eroding democracy, and shrinking opportunities. So how can we deal with all of this? Well, our biggest untapped resource is right in front of us. Surprised? Consider this. When black men graduate from high school with a solid foundation, we go on to solve big problems. We serve our country and earn college degrees in the millions. We build new businesses at a faster rate and contribute more of our income to charity than the average American household. But right now, America is only getting one out of seven black boys proficient in reading by fourth grade and only one in 10 proficient in science by eighth grade. By high school, our country is enrolling only one out of eight young black men in advanced placement classes and only getting one out of three off to college. America can do better. Just imagine the things we can accomplish if all of us have a real opportunity to learn. Our country's future gets a lot brighter. See what's possible. So that little clip was an introduction, a foray into the work by way of diversity, equity, and inclusion, the work that I do to move populations beyond the scratch line, and the work that I do to fulfill the mission that Dr. King set forward with us in this uh, I Have a Dream speech, my work on Black males. But let me share with you just a bit more. Any discussion of equity, diversity, and inclusion, particularly equity as it relates to my population of interest, Black males, I shared this uh, information with you to see kind of what the state of affairs is as we look at high achieving or academically gifted and talented Black males. These are some facts and stats. We see that approximately 13% of uh, elementary students from high income families are enrolled in gifted programs compared to just 2% of students from low income families. And this was a landmark study that came from uh, researchers and scholars at Vanderbilt University and the University of Florida. But even more troubling, you see here that students from the most affluent families are six times more likely than the least affluent students to be identified as gifted. So as you can see, there's a lot of work to be done in my particular area of focus in equity, um, diversity, and inclusion. And the uh, picture here kind of gives you a good idea of rendering of uh, just what we're talking about when we're talking about equality versus equity. And many times I share with um, my doctoral students or individuals when I'm uh, talking about these issues related to diversity, social justice, we have to be careful not to get your ease twisted. Equity and equality are two different things. They're two different concepts. They're two different terms. And they have two different meanings. If we look at throwing equal resources to inequitable situations, we're not going to uh, forge progress. So as you see, the, um, the picture here depicts the difference between equity and equality. I mean, the children are trying to see the baseball, soccer game, the soccer game here. And you see that they both require different accoutrements, different um, supports to assist them in actually seeing the game. But if we just said equal across the board, everyone gets the same box or the same uh, support, we see that um, it would be different circumstances for these particular students just because they have different starting materials. So they're not starting at equitable situations. So doing equal things for inequitable situations keeps us uh, stymied and um, beneath the scratch line. So on this particular slide, and this, this delves even deeper into my particular uh, line of research and my work, I work a lot with school districts and with um, higher ed institutions. And many times I work with groups who are starting black male initiatives, or they have gifted and talented programs or advanced placement programs or rites of passage programs. And one of the first things that I do, I go in and I show this collage and I'm working with the group. I'm like, well, I pose this question to you, who's gifted? As you look at this collage, as you look at these black males who are depicted here, if you had to identify those black males from this picture, just looking at the phenotypic characteristics, who would you identify as being gifted? 
and I will share with you as I work across school districts. Um, many times I get the, uh, the great answer of everyone is, and we go into this robust discussion about every, how everyone manifests gifts and talents in different ways. But then there are times when I go in particular places where I get, well, the um, the black male there at the bottom in the center with the saggy uh, sagging pants, um, I'm sure he's not gifted. Or the black males in the upper right corner who appear to be um, incarcerated or in some type of a chain gang. Um, sometimes that elicits a discussion by saying that, oh, those individuals can be gifted because they uh, appear to be incarcerated. But we know, and I know, and I try to share with them from the research that the tale of who's gifted, it, it goes beyond those phenotypic characteristics. We have to delve beneath, we have to delve deeper into who these men are and what they bring to the education context, what their backgrounds are. And a lot of that relates to how they, their experiences and how they actually view the world and how we can combine those experiences and galvanize them into um, a real world experience that allows them to be successful. Very, very important. And again, this ties into the work that I'm doing on these black males. So who is gifted? That's one question. But here is one piece of information that I'd like to share with you. We know in our public schools or in our schools, there are three primary reasons that black males go unidentified or underidentified for gifted and talented courses. I call them the big three. The big three are lack of teacher referrals. Sometimes we call it teacher nominations. Number two, poor test performance, standardized testing. And number three, C-H-O-I-C-E, choice. So three, these three factors together they are the three primary reasons that we see under identification or non identification of our high achieving black male populations. And each one we could spend uh, an hour just discussing and unpack what it means. You know, teachers don't refer, they don't nominate students when they struggle to identify. And most of us don't connect um, true gifts and talents with um, how the individual appears. So, and actually, most of the time, those connections are false. So we look at those phenotypic characteristics and then we choose to uh, pick and choose those students who are gifted and talented based on what we see and what we perceive about that student based on what we see. Standardized testing, um, that's a whole story in and of itself. We know that um, there is implicit bias many times, uh, cultural loadings um, impact uh, how students perform on standardized testing. And it also has a lot to do with cultural and social capital. Students come to, and again, this goes back to the equity discussion that we just had. Students bring different cultural and social capital. There are some students, they don't have, um, parents don't have um, resources to have uh, maybe books in the home, um, technology. So those cultural resources are very, very key and critical to providing students with a head start when they um, come into the education uh, context. And social capital, having parents who have networks and who have connections to get their kids into the right clubs, organizations, or get them connected to tutoring and those different things. Or they have friends who are doctors, who are lawyers, who can talk to their kids. So that whole notion of cultural and social capital also ties into um, how students actually perform. And then finally, the whole notion of student choice. There is a term that is very, very pervasive in gifted and talented education called under -ident disidentification. Disidentification is when a student chooses to disidentify with being gifted and talented. So this student could be profoundly gifted, but he chooses to be to not manifest or show those gifts and talents because being gifted, being talented, being smart is a high opportunity cost. I'm smart, but my friends, my colleagues, my peers don't want to associate with me. And that's a hard pill to swallow for many, not just for black males, just for students in general during those developmental years. So teacher referral, poor test performance, and student choice, the big three, 
in my particular area of research as I look at trying to ensure equity for student population, black male student populations in schools. I just want to share with you, that was on the uh, K-12 and the big three. I want to share with you all of my years of research focusing on black males, academically gifted black males in the post-secondary context. So I have studied, I primarily study black males who are gifted and talented and uh, who are college students and mainly in the area of STEM. So my years of research, I have found looking at black males and what assists them in being successful in the HBCU and the PWI context, it boils down to these factors. At the core of all of the work that I've done, I found that the institutional environment, whether the student chooses to attend a historically black college or university or a predominantly white institution. So at the core, the environment that is set, that environmental context has so much to do with all of the uh, success and the factors that impact the student and the student's success. But at the core is institutional environment, but around that relationships with faculty. Students have to have a faculty member to help them to negotiate and navigate the terrain. So having that faculty member, that mentor means so much to student academic success. Peer relationships are important. We use the term in higher education, critical mass. So having a critical mass of other black males who are highly successful so that student can have peers and have comrades that they can, they can uh, connect with to assist them in moving along on the uh, educational achievement trajectory. Self-perception, self-esteem, very, very important. One of my colleagues is Dr. Um, Gilman Whiting and he has a theory called the scholar identity model. And what Whiting says is that before you can get black males to be successful, you got to first convince them that they can be scholars. So that whole notion of self-perception, self-esteem has everything to do with their success. Do they believe? But before you delve into self-perception, self-esteem, you have to first believe that they can be scholars. So that model doesn't work unless you don't believe at your core that these students can be successful. And then finally, choice. The whole notion of college selection and choice. Why are these students, why are these black male students choosing to attend Prairie View A&M University? Why are they choosing to attend Texas A&M University? Why are they choosing Rice? Why are they choosing uh, the University of Texas? So it's very, very important to get inside their heads to understand at a very, very base level what were the uh, factors that led to you choosing this institution? And the reason that I say that and I found in my research is that it's very, very important because when these black males run up against obstacles and they run up against challenges, and we all do um, in our undergraduate and our educational experiences, but when they run up against these challenges and when they want to stop out, drop out, quit, you pull back on those uh, choice factors that they say, well, the reason that you chose to come here is that you wanted to become an engineer. The reason you chose to come here is that you you wanted to be, uh, you wanted to get your business degree or you wanted to get that accounting degree. So all of these factors across my research, I have found they coalesce into what makes, what helps black males to be successful in the uh, post-secondary environment. The last question I have for you, the first question was, how am I contributing? This question is, how will I contribute to MLK's dream? And I want you to sit with that and truly think about. So I posed quite a few questions uh, in this short period of time, some questions from Dr. Proctor and some questions that I've kind of formulated around Dr. King and his uh, I Have a Dream uh, speech. And this very, very last video, um, it really gives a, it sets the stage for us to deeply think about equity, diversity, and inclusion, and who gets to move forward and who gets left behind. The winner of this race will take this. It's a hundred dollar bill. Before I say go, 
I'm going to make a couple statements. If those statements apply to you, I want you to take two steps forward. If those statements don't apply to you, I want you to stay right where you're at. Take two steps forward if both of your parents are still married. Take two steps forward if you grew up with a father figure in the home. Take two steps forward if you had access to a private education. Take two steps forward if you had access to a free tutor growing up. Take two steps forward if you've never had to worry about your cell phone being shut off. Take two steps forward if you've never had to help mom or dad with the bills. Take two steps forward if it wasn't because of your athletic ability, you don't have to pay for college. Take two steps forward if you never wondered where your next meal was going to come from. I want you guys up here in the front just to turn around and look. Every statement I've made has nothing to do with anything any of you have done. Has nothing to do with decisions you've made. Everything I've said has nothing to do with what you've done. We all know these people up here have a better opportunity to win this hundred dollars. Does that mean these people back here can't race? No. We would be foolish to not realize we've been given more opportunity. We don't want to recognize that we've been given a head start. But the reality is we have. Now, there's no excuse. They still got to run their race. You still got to run your race. But whoever wins this hundred dollars, I think it'd be extremely foolish of you not to utilize that and learn more about somebody else's story. Because the reality is, if this was a fair race and everybody was back on that line, I guarantee you some of these black dudes would smoke all of you. And it's only because you have this big of a head start that you're possibly going to win this race called life. That is a picture of life, ladies and gentlemen. Nothing you've done has put you in the lead that you're in right now. When I say go, on your mark, get set, go. If you didn't learn anything from this activity, you're a fool. These are some of the references that I've used across the presentation to kind of undergird what I'm sharing with you today. And I'd be happy to share there are many, many more. But in this short presentation, I figured I'd just give you a few. It's the egghead in me. I just have to have references. So at this point, I think I will stop. Thank you. giving you the right to be uh, privileged like you are. I mean, you were born into this, so, but it's important for you, since you have it, to look around and look behind you to see what you can do to assist others to um, move and to progress and to exceed and to excel. And let me share with our audience, if you have questions uh, that you would like to ask in addition to those that we already have captured uh, earlier, you can place them in the chat so that we can then make sure that we address those to Dr. Bonner. Dr. Bonner, let me ask you the one first question so that you can begin and we can uh, establish additional questions. Why have you chosen to focus on research as a central point of your MLK speech? Yes, that is a, a great question. 
And I chose to focus on research because that is at the core, it is part and parcel to who I am, um, being a researcher, being a scholar. So I was always taught by my mentors, you know, play to your strengths and play in your wheelhouse. So my, uh, my wheelhouse is research. My wheelhouse is diversity, equity, and inclusion that is, um, uh, serves as a framework, but also undergirds all of the research that I do. I mean, my sole mission in being in the academy has been to foreground research, and not only to foreground research, but to foreground research that focuses on marginalized or oppressed populations. Um, uh, Ms. Broaddus, you know that uh, I started my career, I was first tenured at the University of Texas San Antonio, so my very first um, assist, uh, moving from associate, assistant to associate there at San Antonio really set the foundation. And I always say that San Antonio, in my experience at UTSA, I really, really am thankful that I started off my academic career there because I had um, a lot of people who were there who um, very early on gave me that nurturing. And I see this um, too often go, uh, it's derail uh, with uh with uh, new faculty who come into the environments where they're starting the tenure, cl tenure clock and they're um, moving, grooving, and they're trying to get their feet on the ground and don't have a lot of support. They kind of feel like they're isolated. They're working in silos. That was absolutely not my experience at UTSA. I had uh, friends. I had colleagues who supported me. I had folks who tell me that you look okay, you sound okay, you smell okay, you're doing good work. So all of those things were so, so very important for me being able to get in very early and to do the work that I found to be very important to me. And now the work that I see is um, becoming very important, not only nationally, but internationally. But that is why I chose research, because it's so endemic to who I am. It is who I am at my core. What advice do you have for someone who looks around and wonders how racism will be dissolved when so many families and institutions perpetuate the ideas in their day-to-day -day lives and from one generation to another? That is a great question. And I will say the um, dissolving uh, and the dissolution of race and racism and um, before I say what I'm going to say, let me um, share with you, and this kind of goes back to the research piece. Um, one of the theories and one of the theoretical frameworks that's very, very important to my research is called critical race theory. So I would encourage uh, those of you who have not engaged in research and scholarship in this area to look up critical race theory. And uh, critical race theory has a number of tenets, but the very first tenet it says that basically racism is an endemic part of our fabric here in this country. So basically it is an is, it is what it is. So it's there. So how do we start to recognize working from the standpoint, knowing that it's like um, in geometry, the given, it's a given racism is there. So recognizing is the first place to start and getting when you look left and when you look right and when you look at left and right and those people don't look like you, it is important to get them to first understand that, you know, this is not something that's just anecdotal. This is my lived existence. So I am actually dealing with issues of race. So let's, I need you to be open to at least having the conversation and having the conversation before you do that, you have to recognize that this thing exists. So to dissolve, we first have to recognize what that it exists, so that racism is, racism is there. And I say once you uh, first get past the uh, initial, and it kind of takes, a, I don't want to make it sound like it's just like a passing easy, quick thing. So first getting folks to understand that racism is real. And after that piece, then we start to go through the process of what I always say in my doctoral classes, um, we need to problematize and deconstruct. So now let's start to problematize what we mean by this term race and racism. And what does problematizing mean? You know, I always, I say that um, we all have issues. 
People Magazine has issues. We don't solve issues, we solve problems. So how can we take these issues and create and coalesce these issues? I mean, it may be a thousand different issues, but how can we take all those issues and crystallize those into a problem? Um, this is something that I do on a routine basis with my doctoral students. Um, I'm teaching dissertation seminar um, this semester. I just had uh, eight of my students last night in class virtually. And one of the main things that I um, push uh, at, in that class is that, okay, what is your problem? Because everything hinges on your problem. You know, I'll have students coming in and I, I say, well, you know what? Just like I was, I can tell you're a neophyte researcher just starting. They're like, well, how do you know that, Dr. Bonner? I said, well, don't be offended. But I said, I can tell that you haven't done very much research because you came to this class telling me that you're going to do a, a qualitative dissertation. Or you came to this class telling me, oh, I'm a stats guy. I'm going to do a quantitative dissertation. I'm like, how can you know what your methods are when you don't know what your problem is? And what is your question? What is your question? What is the problem? So I would say with racism, once we identify that racism is the problem, now we get into the hard work of problematizing and deconstructing. And how do we, what do I mean by deconstruction? I mean, you need to take that problem and deconstruct what it means in different contexts. So long story short, let me step back. When I say context, I define context as being three different things. I mean, other people define it different ways and that's fine. I mean, but I define context as being people, place, and situation. Who are the people? What's the place? And what is the situation that we're dealing with? And I think when we're thinking about race, using using uh, context as a as a lens, it really brings things to bear. So now I have race as a construct and I'm problematizing it and I want to see it carried out through each one of these variables through people, through place and through situation. So now you have a framework to actually start to attack this problem. So let's 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 take it to like a logical end. Let's let's use for example, okay, racism. People. Are we talking about African Americans? Are we talking about Hispanic? Are we talking about Latinx? Are we talking about Asian? Are we talking about bi biracial, multiracial? Are we talking about LGBTQ? What is who are the people that we're talking about? Let's do that first. Then we need to look at the place. So often we ignore the importance of place. In education, in the research, we, we, um, we fancy it up a little bit and we say environment. <laughs> so what, are we, what do we know about the environment? And I will tell you, it is so, so very important. The place slash the environment. You can't just gloss over that. There is an entire course that I teach in the doctoral program. I um, taught it at Texas A&M. I taught it at um, Rutgers. Um, and I taught this course at UT San Antonio when I was there in the higher ed program. The course is called Assessing education, Higher Educational Environments. For just a short term, concise term, we call it environments in higher ed. You know, so it's like, oh, Bonnie, you're teaching the environments course this semester. Well, I will tell you, the environments course, what that entire, I mean, a whole semester, a whole course, a whole three hour course, um, we spend all that time talking about the impact, the influence of the higher education environment on students, on faculty, on administrators. And coming into that course, I start off and I share with the students <clears throat> that, um, it's really, really important to look at the underlying framework that drives our focus on environments. And that is Kurt Lewin's theory, L-E-W-I-N. It's called Kurt Lewin's Interactionist Theory. And what Lewin said is that behavior is a function of the person times the environment. If you draw it out, it looks like, it looks like B equals F P times E. Behavior is the function of the person times the environment. 
And basically what Lewin is saying in that is that you can get any behavioral outcome by looking at what the people do and, and their influence and looking at what the environment does. That's powerful. You can alter, you can get any particular behavioral outcome if you not only look at the people, but if you look at the environment. So there, so I'll, I'll stop there, but those are some of the reasons that research and looking at research and how it ties to race that, um, the reason why. And I, let me ask you, I, in the chat, I see we have a question. Howdy, howdy, Dr. Bonner, specific disciplines, especially, especially those in STEM fields, utilize, overutilize standardized testing as a pre predictive tool because uh, licensure often requires graduates to pass similar exams. How can these curricula move beyond standardized tests as an evaluation tool for minimum capacities to move the scratch line? That is an excellent question. Um, and it's actually one of the uh, big three that I mentioned when I, um, when I referenced Donna Ford's work, uh, teacher nominations, um, choice, and standardized testing. And for that particular question, I think that one of the things that we have to do, and uh, me being um, a person in education, my um, and I've spent a lot more time looking at testing, the influence of testing. I'm kind of on the back end of it now, given the fact that most of my work in scholarship and where I'm ensconced is uh, in a higher ed administration program and talking about higher ed. But I didn't start here. My early career, my uh, my master's level training, my master's degree is from Baylor University in uh, curriculum and instruction. So I always say I'm a little bit country and a little bit rock and roll. So I have spent a lot of time uh, looking at K-12 issues um, and uh, also going through, um, <laughs> um, it was interesting. I, um, because I, uh, my undergrad degree, I came from uh, an undergrad degree in chemistry and went into a, a master's degree in education. Um, and I thought it was horrible at the time, but I really appreciate it now. So at that, um, I should say at that time, I guess, it's, it's still the same way now. Baylor would not allow you to graduate with a master's degree in education, particularly in K-12 education, unless you were a certified teacher. So while I was in my master's program, I had to go back and I uh, actually had to take the um, exit exam. Um, and I actually did student teaching during my master's program. I, um, I had did student teaching at um, Waco High School um, in chemistry. So, and at that time, I was very, very involved and concerned about, you know, testing, standardized testing and what the impact of testing. And one of the things that I learned that goes to the question that was just asked. In some of my research, one of my favorite theorists at that time and still to this day, he, uh, he passed away several years ago. But he made a very, very important point about testing. And I think it really speaks to this question. Scholar Asa, A-S-A, Hilliard, Asa Hilliard. And Asa Hilliard, he said that when it comes to testing, a test will ask uh, one of two questions. And the problem comes in there because often we zero in on the wrong question. The two questions are, What do you know? The second question is, do you know what I know? And he said, the problem is, is we usually gravitate on question two. The tests that we use are typically tests that measure not what I know. They measure, do I know what you know? Now, what do I mean? What did Asa Hillier mean by all that? What Hillier was basically saying is that the information, the knowledge, thinking, everything on that particular test is not so much about who I am, my community, how I learn things. It's all about the person who designed the test, 
and the person who chose to use that particular test. So I think to the question, the only way we can get to start moving towards equity and understanding how and having um, more successful outcomes when uh, we have so many people using these standardized tests is to start to shift the narrative and start to shift what we do with these tests by moving to a point where it's not about trying to figure out if you know what I know, how can I come up with, with, with a reliable, a valid test that, um, that really shows and really tests what it is that you know? Now, whether that means you're going to have to have like some cultural filters, uh, are there some <clears throat> things that we need to uh, encode into these uh, tests that are related to gender, related to race, related to uh, socioeconomic status? Yeah. And how do you do that? I mean, there are a whole bunch of smart people and they spend their lives developing tests. But so often, our different uh, units don't talk to each other. There is a whole body of researchers out there that get PhDs, they spend their lives, they're called psychometricians. And they, when they do psychometrics, these are people that just come up with reliable, val uh, valid tests and we should be talking, the psychometricians should be talking to the folks who do all the cultural and ethnic stuff and uh, diversity stuff. So I think it should be where diversity, equity, and inclusion meets uh, the uh, psychometrics, uh, psychometric, uh, psychometricians. They need to come together to come up with some culturally valid, culturally reliable testing. Until that time, we're still, we're still going to get those standardized tests that measure what the folks who created the test say uh, is knowledge. Thank you, Dr. Bonner. What suggestions do you have to increase African-American male graduation rates from universities? Ooh, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> that happens to be uh, one of my uh uh, core areas of focus. And I share with you in the video presentation, I don't know if you remember uh, my model, the A-G-B-M-E model, which is the academically gifted black male engagement model, A-G-B-M-E. And that particular model is um, it's a galvanizing of all of the years of my research and my work of my scholarship. So everything that I've learned about black males, um, and especially black males in colleges and universities is kind of all distilled into the factors that I found um, to contribute to their success that are, that are articulated in that model. So uh, to the question at the core of everything um, that I have found, all the work that I've done, the main thing that we have to look at is the institutional environment. And I have studied black males in uh PWIs, HBCUs. So, and I need to, uh, moving forward with my research, I should expand my MSI focus and also look at the experiences of African-American males or Black males in Hispanic serving institutions. The interesting thing is I haven't um, looked at my work or looked at the lens, looked at uh, Black males through the lens of a a HSIs, but I have uh, looked at Black women uh, one of my studies is called Triple Jeopardy. It looks at the experiences of African-American women in Hispanic-serving institutions, which is basically a study that I did looking at Black women who were at UTSA at the time. But anyway, say all that to say, if you look at my model, you see uh, the factors that I have found to influence Black male success, um, particularly in STEM, but not just STEM, but a very strong focus in STEM. And a lot of that comes from my own emic perspectives having um being a stem person um uh undergrad stem person um so um the factors uh you have things like number one factor is a relationship with faculty you need to ensure that these black males have a relationship with a faculty member who can serve as a role model who can serve as a mentor to help him negotiate and navigate the system we all needed that, not just black males. I mean, white students need that. But having a faculty member, and it doesn't have to be someone who, who you think in traditional faculty roles like me, who is a professor, it can be a staff person. It can be uh, 
uh, someone in administration, but they kind of serve in a faculty-esque type of positionality with those uh, black males. So relationship with a faculty member is important. Number two, family influence and support. We know from the literature and beyond the literature, I know from my own experiences and I know from the experiences of my friends, of my friends and their kids, that black males, uh, really black and brown people, we uh, when we go off to college, we never really leave home. We, we do, but we don't. We're always connected to mom and dad. We're always connected to family. Um, in some type of way, family has influence and they provide supports that are important for that student's success in college. So we never really completely just go off to college. So because we know that these Black males are still very connected to their families, we need to leverage those relationships in positive ways. Does that mean that I'm saying that you should have the family to the campus like every other week? No. (laughs) I'm saying that there are ways that we need to find how to effectively connect uh, connect with those families and show that we are ambassadors for that student and connecting with that student and we're invested in that student's success. Thank you. I see we have another question in the chat. Dr. Bonner, can you talk about how your research can affect retention rates of not just gifted African-American males, but students of color? Yes, absolutely. So I think that um, one of the things that um, my research um, has done, although my um, although the core of my focus has been gifted African American males, I would say that's the core, but that is not the um, that's not the end point of the research. I think because I'm studying um, black males who are probably in education the most marginalized and oppressed population. I think that that research actually translates to what is also uh, effective for other populations and other um, other um, identity groups, identity affinity groups. Um, And the reason I say that um, the black male research is always at the core of my work. But then when you look, when I move beyond just my research on black males, it focuses on so many other populations that were influenced by the core of my work that gave, and it served as a foundation for them to overlay or to build on to actually look at their particular population. Classic example, I have a book series with Routledge Press and my book series is our diverse faculty in the academy. The very first book in my book series is a book that focuses on this concept called racial battle fatigue. Racial battle fatigue is a concept, it is a term that was coined, it was developed by Dr. Uh, William Smith at the University of Utah. And I will tell you, much of the early work on racial battle fatigue, you will see, was completed by African-American scholars, by Black scholars who were talking about their experiences being Black and being African-American in predominantly white spaces. So a lot of the early, early work on racial battle fatigue and even some of the contemporary work on racial battle fatigue, it is, has been mainly used by black scholars and African-American scholars. But guess what? The very first book in my series was the experiences of faculty dealing with racial battle fatigue, but it wasn't black faculty. It wasn't Hispanic faculty. It was Asian American faculty. So the focus um, of um, that particular book on racial battle fatigue includes the experiences, the narratives of Asian American faculty, how they experience marginalization in um, predominantly white context. So that's one example, but I would also say that my work has also been used just like my last book on black males building on resilience Um, that came out in 2016 but i'm currently working on a proposal um, building on resilience uh, latinx males so i would say that because the black male research is the core but that doesn't mean that is the only um, 
outlet for other areas of research, but it can serve as a foundation for what my other colleagues do who are Asian, Hispanic, LGBTQ. Thank you, Dr. Bonner. I need to go back to a question that was placed on our uh, board from when people registered. And this one ought to stick with you just because you're a member of Alpha Phi Alpha. I am. I am. <laughs> The person said, I just witnessed the inauguration yesterday, and I was moved more than I thought I would be at seeing Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor swear in our first woman vice president of the USA. She said, wow, and a woman of color. Instantly, I reflected on my own battles along the way, and I couldn't help but just say, yes, thank you. Keep on. What did you have to say about that moment? Oh, it was, it not, not only it was, it is. <laughs> it is uh, absolutely amazing. Um, and it's funny, in my, um, I share with you, I'm teaching uh, a doctoral dissertation seminar class, and there, uh, there are 10 students, there are eight students, there are eight students in that class, and uh, well, nine now. So the same cohort that I had last semester in that class, I, they rolled over to this semester. So we just met last night. And um, of the nine students that are there, um, um, two of the students are um, AKAs. And I was, uh, we were just talking about um, what this experience meant, um, how it was, um, could, it is such, so life changing to so many. And they were saying that, you know, of all the people that we see on Facebook, we, we said, how good does it feel that our professor, Dr. Bonner, they said, you posted so much. They said, actually, yours was the first picture that we saw our Sara there on the cover of uh, Vogue magazine. So they said, you have been so supportive. I said, well, yeah, ski fi to the end. <laughs> but I think the important message that it conveys is that it shows what is possible. And she said this in her speech that, um, you know, I'm the first, but I won't be the last. And I think, you know, I, this gets into, um, for me, I don't want to intellectualize it too much, but, but it's just real. I, I actually plan on writing about this because um, I was so, um, huh, it so took me aback when I read just this week, um, that uh, it didn't happen just this week, but uh, I saw the article this week that uh, one of the school districts there in the uh, Dallas Fort Worth area, um, there were complaints and the superintendent was basically, she didn't sanction, but uh, she kind of uh, sent a strong message to um, her teachers because many of the teachers wore, um, wore their chucks and pearls. So they had the t-shirts on chucks and pearls. And many of uh, the parents, the community members uh, uh, complained and said that what they did in those schools, those teachers should be sanctioned because it goes against the whole notion of political neutrality. At my core, I get that. I get it. One of my best friends from high school, I graduated from, uh, I'm from rural East Texas, small town East Texas. So one of my best friends from high school from Jefferson, Texas, who's actually a principal now in Waco, came over to um, spend a couple of days with me. She sends me a message. She says, I want some of your turkey chili. I'm on the way. So she came over and spent several days with me. And uh, she was saying, uh, you know, it's interesting. She said, you know, as an assistant principal, I always have to be mindful. But she said, you know, we were just kind of like, eh, whatever. She said, we didn't, we didn't plan it. We didn't tell people to do it. She said, but all of us, particularly when she said all of us, I knew she was talking about black folks, particularly black women. She's talking about, no, she was talking about black women. She said, all of us in the school, we wore our, we wore our chucks and pearls all except for one. Um, and she said, and I know she said, I'm in a very, um, uh, non-Biden-esque school, I guess that's the best way I could say it. And she said, I knew it was a risk, but she said, but we, we threw caution to the wind because we so believed in this moment, moment that we decided to do it. That made me think. And I said, I have got to write about this because 
I think that this goes to the very core of kind of what I've been saying about problematizing and deconstructing. That goes to the very core of the fact that our narratives are different. And our narratives are different because we come from different cultural communities. Um, I could reduce it down to just saying black and white. I can just reduce it down to saying um, uh, minority, non-minority. Um, however, but what I think in this particular case, particularly for black folks who have really resonated with um, Kamala Harris and uh, her being named VP, the narratives and the narrative focus is different. Um, when I hear black folks talk about Kamala Harris, what we see is that the prom she's given us the promise of life. She's given us the promise of life. I am a black person who now I can come to life and I can be in this space. My ontological being is now validated by the fact that this woman is up there. I turn to the left and I look at my white colleagues. They see, well, some, <laughs> not all, their narratives about liberty and the pursuit of happiness. So here I am, I'm over here just trying to grab onto life. And you're, you're beyond me because you have the, um, if you want to call it privilege, you can, but you have the opportunity. Let's call it that if, if privilege, privilege gives you some indigestion. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. For me, Kamala Harris represents life. That's my foundation. And now I can slowly get to where you are thinking about liberty and the pursuit of happiness. So that is kind of like the best explanation that I have for what it has meant to me. Thank you. And believe me, today I goofed. Every day since Inauguration Day, I've had my pearls on. <laughs> <laughs> Keep wearing them. Keep uh, hey, them. they've been on. Mm -hmm. Question here in the chat. We know that there is a way to change these disparities on standardized tests, but until we get a new way of testing, how can us as a community create ways to make people aware of that and create maybe an adaption in order to decrease the gap between scores? Most people do not know about this gap between scores unless they take a step back and are able to see a bigger picture. That's a great question. I would say it starts with uh, educating and education. You got to get folks aware of what those issues are. And I think they can't um, grab on to wanting to do something about it. They can be passionate about moving moving the needle or doing something or taking action if they don't know what they're taking action about. Mm -hmm. So I'm always, and I guess that's the professor in me, I'm always going to be a proponent of education first. Um, one of the first things I tell my doctoral students is that, you know what, I'm going to, I'll always have several books, several articles and things that you all need to read because that is the main problem with um, not just y'all, I'm not just trying to narc on you in front, I'm just talking. But it's um, the main problem with so many uh, students who are in the doctoral programs who want to go into graduate programs. You know, you want to be an expert before you know anything. You want, you want the roof, but you haven't built the foundation. So what we have to do, you got to read. No one reads anymore. You need to sit down with this book, with these articles. You got to read something because y'all don't know nothing. So and you shouldn't. I mean, you're here to learn, but I'm telling you the first place in this process is you got to start with knowledge. I mean, Bloom's taxonomy, lowest level. Let's start, let's start with let's start with knowledge. Um, developing that knowledge. So before you can start to get people to try to affect change and to think differently about testing, they've got to have some knowledge about it, you know. What does it mean? You know, what is a standardized test? And how are these tests considered to be um, culturally biased? What is cultural bias? You know, can you share with me what's being said about how these tests are, how they disenfranchise Hispanic kids, how they disenfranchise African-American kids, how they, 
heck, how they disenfranchise poor white kids. So reading all that stuff, so now you come to this intellectual space with a new understanding because you read something, because you know something. So the first place to start with this narrative, I mean, and I see it all the time. I mean, we, we want change, we want people to understand, but you can't blame folks for not moving um, what we're doing with standardized testing or doing things for black and brown kids when they don't know what they're talking about. So, and many times, will they go and read those things? Maybe not. Therefore, that means that you have to read to be able to share with them what it is they need to know. So once we start with developing a knowledge base, then we start the uh, heavy lifting. You know, we got the floor. So now on the floor, now we start to bring in, um, bring in the furniture, bring in the, uh, the uh, important pieces. And those important pieces can be, so you got knowledge, you got education. So now we need to start looking at the nuances. You know, what does this mean for this particular community? What does this mean for teachers? What does it mean for administrators? You know, what does it mean for community? What does it mean for parents? So, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Enrique wants to ask Dr. Bonner, how does family faith influence a young black man's education experience? Was that faith? Faith, yes. Oh, faith, yeah. Uh, faith has a very strong influence. Um, and I would say not just for black males, kind of across the uh, black and brown diaspora. And the reason I say that, when I was at, U when I, when I was at UT San Antonio, I was actually a, um, a postdoctoral scholar at, uh, at Yale University. And um, Yale had me to conduct a study because they were looking at, they were doing this large national study looking at giftedness among diverse, among what they call minority populations. So they wanted a researcher out there in the field who could do research on uh, Hispanic students. And being there at UT San Antonio at that time, I actually was able to fund several of my graduate students. And we actually did a uh, study looking at how Hispanic middle school students, how they define success. And we went out to, um, and we looked at, we looked at students at the middle school level, the middle grades level, they call it. And we went to several middle schools there in San Antonio and went through the whole IRB process, but we were able to interview uh, somewhere between 50 and 75 middle school kids. And it was the most interesting study. Um, and it really revealed how different populations, how, and particularly the Hispanic population, how these kids, how they viewed their success. And many times when we look at literature, you saw things like, oh, students think that success is only doing well in math and science, doing well in school, doing well. These kids will say, you know, their success, you know, was whether um, uh, it could be about uh, spirituality and, and prayer. So my success is really because um, A, B, and C was God ordained. I prayed for it and that actually happened. So, you know, I'm successful because... I have um, spiritual, I have uh, guidance that moves beyond. So a lot of um, a lot of what we found in that particular study is that faith, spirituality plays such an important, important role. If we move over to African-American students, there is um, one of my colleagues, she actually does work looking at um, African-American students in the uh, post-secondary context in colleges and universities. And what she found was that spirituality played a major, major role in these students' academic success because spirituality at its core, it had an influence on how they identified themselves, their identity. It had an influence on their self-perception, self-esteem. So all of those things kind of went back to a spiritual base. So, it, you know, she talks about in the article how, you know, it's, not unusual for um, uh, African-American students, Blacks, and say, well, let me pray about it. Well, let me. So all of those things would play into their academic success. So 
is it was almost like you know you really kind of thwarted their academic success if you pushed away or had them to push away the uh, their connections to their spirituality and um and I and I don't want to say um not necessarily religion not religiosity spirituality and that was very 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 important for <clears throat> for these students and we know um people come to spirituality many times, most of the time through religion. So they're kind of, for many populations, one and the same. But I do want to say that very, that to that question, very, very important for African-American males. And I think, you know, I know we have the whole thing, state-supported state institutions with the separation of church and state and all that. But I still think it's very, very important to have a way for these a safe space, a safe place for these students to be able to express um, all aspects of their of their identity and relig uh, religion and spirituality is one of those aspects. Thank you. We have another question, Dr. Bonner. What are the effects on an African American that has never had a positive black male? black role model and is engulfed in a majority white community? Oh, that's a very good question. And um, I will make sure um, that you have, um, and I'll, I'll get it to our, our good IT folks helping or into you. There's an article that came out, um, I want to say a couple of, maybe three or four months ago. And this article shows how if a black male has at least one teacher in the elementary school context, on the back end, it increases his chance of success of graduating from high school by something like 30, 40%. So there's an article where they have actually done the research to show it just one, one, no, not one. <laughs> if you only had one black male teacher, that increases the graduation Okay. And the reason um, a big grant to the National Science Foundation and this grant, what we plan on doing is looking at uh, trying to increase the number of black male teachers, particularly here in the Houston Independent School District, black male teachers in STEM. And so we pulled a lot of that literature. So I've kind of been steeped in that question and the literature related to that question for quite some time. But I would say to answer the question, I think it is uh, can be completely catastrophic, completely detrimental. So I think it's very, very important for them to have black role models, black males who can. There's a statement in the um, in one of the videos that I show from um, from uh, Urban Prep Academy in Chicago, and uh, one of the teachers there in that video says it's so important for black males to see us here and to see it's. Urban Prep is a black male academy. And a lot of their teachers, I, I don't I miss, I don't want to say all of their teachers. Uh, I would say a majority of their teachers are uh, black males. And one of the teachers said that it isn't, um, you can't be what you don't see. And I thought that was such a powerful, powerful message. Thank you. And the number of African-American uh teachers has now gone down it'll we will be doing good for our children to even see exactly. male or female mm -hmm. african-american teachers we've done a good job of steering our kids away from education kind of upsetting mm -hmm. and now we don't have anybody there to teach them absolutely I, true yes i love this discussion so much i love the principles you're teaching us we should build every test with the principle of figuring out what students know. Your reflection questions to start every unit semester assignment as well as overall planning. I also have a question about how the lack of inclusion of diverse Englishes in grading standards impedes success and affect family relationships, as well as what must we do to make language standards more inclusive? There are lots of excuses for not doing this. Yes, um, very, very good questions. And I would say it, it, 
it's interesting. I don't want to sound like a broken record, but um, I am going to sound a little bit like a broken record because all this goes back to some of the core things that I said uh, in response to previous questions. It starts with you're not going to be able to dismantle and disaggregate um, what we are doing, the good things, the bad things, um, the improvements that we need to make related to um, testing, related to um, um, English, English language learners, to uh, changing uh, the narrative and understanding about success until you get people educated and aware of what the issues actually are. So there are people that if you said, oh, there's is there are issues with testing and there are issues with um, cultural loadings and, uh, and just with language, how students struggle with language, um, many people are just so unaware. Again, it goes back to how are we educating folks? One of my presentations, um, I'm very active in the uh, Texas Association of Gifted and Talented, TAGT. So they have me to come every year to give a, uh, a talk, um, presentation workshop at the, at the annual conference. And in one of my presentations, I, um, I put this video clip in there. And basically the video clip, it shows where um, this uh, teacher, she, uh, she goes into the school, she's in a classroom and she's there. It's kind of like a parent teacher meeting, all these parents are there. And she goes in and she speaks, uh, she's speaking Spanish the entire class. I mean, the entire, she starts speaking in Spanish uh, for the forum. And so the parents are like leaning over, like, what is she saying? Well, what does that mean? So she, she would, uh, she would repeat and she was, you know, like, like a classroom teacher. She's like, she would say the words, she would say it again. And then, and then the only, um, the only, um, uh, the only parents that could understand were the few Hispanic parents there. So they would come over and lean in and try to help. And basically the message that was being conveyed is like, well, what do you think some of these students, how do they, how they feel being um, ESL or being uh, ELL, being in these environments where they struggle to understand, you know, it has nothing to do with their intelligence, but it has everything to do with the way we, you set up the context for their success. And Dr. Bonner, men of color are often looked at from a position of deficit as it relates to education. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the impetus uh, for the research you did on African-American women at UTSA? Did your findings lend any insight into your research on success for men of color? Great question. Yes. And um, that's another piece that I can get to uh get to Ms. Broadus and share with the group. Uh, the article is uh, titled Triple Jeopardy, um, African-American Women in Hispanic Serving Institution. And that particular, um, that particular study, we wanted to look at what it meant to be um, African-American, female, and in a Hispanic serving institution. So, um, and what we found when we looked um looked at the uh, data and started to analyze and to, uh, to code. And some of the themes that emerged was that um, these women felt like they were uh, living on the margins, meaning that um, I am a, a woman of color or I am, I am a minority, but I'm in, I'm in a uh, minority serving institution but I'm in a minority serving institution where I'm not the majority. So a lot of them talked about being in this space that is this minority serving space, but it doesn't, I'm not the majority, not the minority and majority. So I've always, I always feel like issues related to black people in this particular space, not always feel like many times I feel like issues related to black people in this Hispanic serving institution are always um, are frequently on the margin. So I don't feel like I'm necessarily completely in the fabric. So that was a really, really important thing, um, which also, you know, the question was, did it inform your research on black males? Absolutely. So what the women said about being bl a black woman in a Hispanic serving institution, that mirrored what black men say about being in uh, predominantly white institutions. 
what does it be? What does it mean to be a black man at Texas A and M University? What does it mean to be a black man at UT Austin? Um, so yes, it it absolutely informed that work, and there were several other. I would actually say that all of our themes. Uh, I'm a little too far away from it now. I should uh, to remember exactly what they were, but I can uh, get you the article so you can see. But to your question, absolutely. Uh, I think all this research looking at marginalized populations, there really is no true, true separation. What happens for black males ha happens for Hispanic males, happens for Asian males, but it's nuanced. You have to look at the nuances, but at the core, the core is really the same. These issues and struggles, I mean, because all these populations struggle with oppression. One of my colleagues, Donna Ford, because often, I'm not often, but many times, we will sometimes get into this um, back and forth match just within the Black African-American diaspora, where sometimes it's like African-American women and their research butts up against African-American men and their research. And then my colleague, Donna Ford, she says all the time, we don't need to get into oppression Olympics. It doesn't have to be that black women are more oppressed than black men. Black men are more oppressed than black women because that really defeats the purpose. Now you divide the diaspora. We all are oppressed. And that's what I would say to that question. You know, when I look at the Asian American experience, I mean, da uh, Nick Nicholas, Nicholas Daniel Hartlip's book, uh, the first book in my series, he's talking about Asian Americans, how they feel oppressed in white institutions. So, yes, I would say it all informs each other. Thank you, Dr. Bonner. And that really should be our last question. I, my one thought, though, I will tell you, is when I looked at that last video, I couldn't help but wonder, what would the movement have been if instead of, do you have, your are your parents, are both your parents married? Mm -hmm. What would it have been if they said, are both your parents still married to each other? Each other, yes. Mm -hmm. I couldn't help but think, mm, yeah, both the parents could be married, but that didn't mean that they could be married to each other. Exactly. Let me turn it over. First, let me tell you, thank you. I really appreciate your agreeing to come uh, to the university, and I really appreciate you taking the time to do so. I want to turn it over to Elliot Howard, who's going to close this time for us. Elliot's probably wanting to choke me for everything that's gotten dumped toward him, but he knows that I love him dearly. <laughs> Elliot. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Professor Broadus. And thank you, Dr. Bonner. Thank you very much on behalf of um, all the folks who were in attendance here today. Um, you know, I, I wanted to not uh, let uh, um, Dr. Keenan's remarks go unnoticed. She was appreciating you for helping us draw a crowd to this. <laughs> excellent. Um, I appreciate all of you. This has been excellent. Uh, excellent. Ellie, you've been great. Uh, Professor Broadus and uh, uh, Professor Keenan, I, I really appreciate, I appreciate all of you. Great, great, great. It's always good to come home. UTSA was where I kind of started this journey. <laughs> uh, well, I will just say two things. And one is to point everyone's attention to the rest of the calendar of events for Black History Month. And I will put the link in the chat here. This is a kickoff event for the, the month a little bit early, and uh, we're glad to get to start things off with the annual MLK lecture series. And the other thing is to, to say how much I appreciate the way that you position belonging at the center of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how it made me reflect on, on the, the deeper and more meaningful sense of that belonging when it is positioned in that way. Mm -hmm. um, and that that came to mind as well during the inauguration and seeing the diversity and richness of our country reflected there more fully 
um, that for so many people that um, inspired that greater sense of truer belonging. And so thanks for your message of um, how we can do our part to contribute to that for our students and for the students to come. Thank you. And so with that, I suppose we will close out and wish everybody a wonderful rest of your afternoon.